Well, we've been considering together in the last few weeks Paul's second men. I hope that you have been able to find a place among this grouping of people, these men, because second men are really necessary, extremely necessary, vitally important in the workings of any ministry of the church, in the works of God. So these men have offered their personality, their talents, their spiritual gifts, working behind the scenes, and if we aren't careful, when we read the book of Acts, we don't notice them very much. We focus on Peter and John. We focus on Paul and Paul's work, and we think less about these second men that we've considered, and I want to review them just for a moment and remind you of just how important they've been. First, there's Barnabas. Barnabas is that unwavering encourager He gives people second chances. Think of the benefit that a man like Barnabas would have been, which was his nickname, son of encouragement, to Paul. As Paul is going about his work with all the discouraging things that they faced, to have this guy who just thinks positively and who encourages and gives people second chances. Next we looked at Silas. Silas was the one who was trusted with documents or with letters to send things that needed to be sent. In an age where you didn't have a postal service and these important letters needed to be sent from churches to churches, like the letters of the, of the Bible or uh, specifically the letters that was uh, crafted there in Acts chapter 15, Silas delivered that letter. He couriered the letter. And also what we mostly remember Silas for is that Acts chapter 16 when he was in the Philippian prison and he was there with his feet in stocks and he was singing praises to God along with Paul. Next we consider Timothy. What did Timothy add as a second man? Well, his youthfulness. It's not just something for older people. It's something for youthful people. Timothy, probably an older teenager at the time, he began working in Paul's ministry, had a very special relationship with Paul, and was faithful in uh, the missionary journeys. Then we considered Luke. Luke is the guy who was the investigative truth seeker, the educated guy, the um, analytical one, we might say, the professional guy, but also because of his his position, his profession as a doctor or a physician, he was used to working with the downtrodden, the more outcasts of society. And because of that, he brings that as a special gift to Paul's work. Now this morning, the second man we're going to look at today is Priscilla. She wasn't a man, she was a woman. This woman is impressive. The Bible doesn't tell us too much about her, But it gives us enough information that we can be impressed in her second man, second woman role, the -the behind-the-scenes person. She was one who worked alongside her husband and used her home as a hub of Christian ministry. And what we find with, with, um, with Priscilla is that she's always using her home. She's having Paul stay with her and other um, ideas we'll look at as the lesson unfolds. Now we are introduced to Priscilla and her husband Aquila in Acts chapter 18. uh, Paul met them in Corinth. After this, it says in Acts 18 verses 1 and 2, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, Because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Now remember, Acts, being written by Luke, gives us the details, the Greek details, that we don't often or always find. Here, Luke mentions the emperor Claudius by name and points to this very real and significant event that was in about 49 or 50 A.D., So in 450 AD, the Roman Emperor Claudius issued this edict expelling all Jews from Rome. And Aquila and Priscilla were among the evacuees, and they settled in Corinth. So I put here this map to show you. You have Italy, and then you have Greece, 
So having to, being forced to leave Rome, Aquila and Priscilla, they go over to Corinth, and that's where they settle. And when Paul then goes to Corinth, he meets them. The Gospel Advocate estimates that there were 20,000 Jews living in Rome at the time. Um, that's quite an evacuation. If you imagine 20,000 people being expelled from a city, you leave quite a gap. Uh, think about the population of Harrison, 13,000. It would be more than that. You know, just a little less than double that, really. Um, or, so it was a lot of people that were evacuated or expelled. And later when Paul arrives in Corinth, where Aquila and Priscilla have relocated, he met them and they were invited into, into their home. He, they invited Paul into their home. Continuing in Acts chapter 18, verses 3 and 4, Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them, and every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. In this text, we discover that Paul was a tent maker. We're thankful for Luke's insight into what Paul did besides his mission work he was trained as a tent maker and when Silas and Timothy uh, arrive with probably with funds Paul devotes himself to full-time ministry it was sometimes necessary for Paul to do manual labor to support his own work as we see here in 1 Corinthians 9 1 Thessalonians 2 and 2 Thessalonians 3 so Paul had this to fall back on when he hadn't ministry funds coming to him that would allow them to eat and to live, then he could do full-time work. But when the funds weren't there, Paul could use his profession, which also is the profession of Priscilla and Aquila, and that is making tents. Burton Coffin says in his commentary on Acts that all the Jews, even the wealthy and the learned, were taught a trade. The Jewish law after the exile held that a father who taught not his son a trade taught him to be a thief. And so this truth we find in Paul. When he had the full-time support, he worked full-time, and if not, he re- uh, then he had to work some. Let's consider these points now as we think about Priscilla specifically in today's lesson. First, She partnered with Aquila in business and in ministry. Aquila and Priscilla were partners. They were partners in life. They were partners in ministry. Their names never appear alone. They're always together. They always are mentioned with their names together. Aquila and Priscilla or Priscilla and Aquila. Together, they they were partners. They worked together. This duo, then, is a testament to a married couple working together, using their joint career, tent makers, using their joint faith, Christians, using their home, inviting Paul there to stay with them, all in the works of God. And here's a picture in case you wonder what they look like, here they are, and they're making tents in, in Corinth. Of course, the only thing is in the first picture, she was a brunette and she's a blonde in this one. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I think it's intriguing that Priscilla's name is mentioned first, more often than Aquila's. You might have overlooked that. I, I had. I didn't even realize it. Aquila's name is first two times when they're mentioned and Priscilla's name four times. So it's Aquila and Priscilla, Aquila and Priscilla, and then it's Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila, and Priscilla and Aquila. Some have suggested that she was a prominent woman and that she stood in more of a a higher social position than her husband, and sometimes that placed her ahead of him because of that social standing. I think if, if we're honest in our look at the Bible, some have criticized the Bible as being oppressive to women. 
And I think if you think about the Bible, and I mentioned Wednesday night in my class, that the Bible is reflective of the time. It's reflective of its culture. And in the first century, first century culture was more oppressive to women. And when you think about the Bible then and how the Bible elevates the position of, of women, we have women like Priscilla. We have scriptures like there is no male nor female, slave nor free. We are all one in Christ. That really the Bible is groundbreaking for women to show that God spiritually values women equally as men. And this woman is put forward for us as an example of a woman who is a second woman working alongside her husband, but yet valuable, yet doing something very significant in the works of Paul and his ministry. Scholars have speculated that the reason for this, that Priscilla's name is first, is that Priscilla maybe was converted before her husband, or perhaps having led Aquila to, to the faith. Or that she played an even more important part in the life and work of the church than her husband. Or alternatively, it has been conjectured that Priscilla was the more dominant of the two. Or of higher social status. That she may have either provided the financial resources or the business. Or been the brains behind it. But whatever the case, these are all speculations. Priscilla is a co-worker in her own right alongside her husband. She is of great personal help to Paul. And she's a formidable presence. In, in the mission work. She partnered with Aquila and Priscilla then in business and in ministry, always working together, uh, working side by side with her husband in the works of God. Number two, she made her home a hub of Christian work. I really like this point. Priscilla was one who opened her home up to people. We call that hospitality. And the Bible does too. She was hospitable in opening up her home to be used for the Lord's work. After being expelled from Rome, Priscilla and Aquila became important strengthening influences to the churches in these places, Corinth and Ephesus, and ultimately back in Rome. But specifically in Corinth and in Ephesus is where we find them most often. And I have a map here showing you those three locations. Rome, Corinth, and Ephesus. It's in these three locations that we really find this couple making a huge impact in the churches there and in Paul's ministry. The Bible is clear that in both Ephesus and in Rome, and here's the point I want you to see, Priscilla hosted the church in her home. The house church. Both places, both in Ephesus and in Rome, in both places, the Bible tells us that the church met in her home. She was hospitable. She opened up her home for the church to meet and to worship and to be a hub of ministry. Here's the evidence for these. First, 1 Corinthians 16, 19. This is about Ephesus. The church in the province of Asia, the churches in the province of Asia, send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. And then in Romans chapter 16, which is the Rome uh, example, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, greet also the church that meets at their house. So we know in these two locations, in Ephesus, and in Rome, Priscilla opened her home up for the church to meet there. For them to come together for fellowship, for the partaking of the Lord's Supper, for worship, for their assemblies. Priscilla reminds me, reminds us of the open hospitality of Jesus' friend Martha. And although in this event in Luke chapter 10... Martha's kind of cast in a bad light because she's worried about the preparations and Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She kind of gets, Mary gets the spotlight in this example in Luke 10. But we can't overlook 38. This was Martha's house. It doesn't say it was Mary's house. Maybe it was all there. Maybe it was Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But it says in the scripture 
that as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. This was her house. It was open to the disciples to be there, to eat, to fellowship, to relax, to recuperate. Um, and so because of that, I'm reminded of Martha when I think about Priscilla. Also, kind of a, a lesser read book of the Bible, Third John. John wrote to Gaius in the book of Third John, commending him for his hospitality to missionaries, which was of utmost necessary in the, in the first century. No days in, no la quinta. If there was going to be missionaries being kept as they traveled about, they had to be kept in people's homes. And so because of that, those hospitable women... Uh, would open up their homes to these, uh, to these missionaries. And Gaius, of course, being a man, but still he's being commended for the fact that he opened his home up. We find this in 3 John, verses 6 through 8. They have told the church about your love. It was for the sake of the name, the name of Jesus, that they, brotherhood ministers, went out receiving no help from pagans. And we ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth. And so, a lot of times, the missionaries who were out traveling, they would stay in homes that were hospitable, hospitable to them. And that way, they could have a place to rest and to eat and to lodge. And that way, they could do the works of God in the daytime. Here are some guide scriptures. 1 Peter 4, 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. It's a good one. Romans 12, 3, share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. And this one, with regards to the qualities of an overseer or an elder, the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. So when we think about our, our leaders, we, we see them as hospitable, as homes that are open to us, to receive us, and to uh, show that kind of hospitality to us. Number three, Priscilla faced death for Paul. I wish I knew what this story was, but we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. It's like this cliffhanger. We've been told that Aquila and Priscilla risked their lives for, for Paul and for the ministry and for Jesus, but we don't know what it was. So although the details of the event are unknown, the Bible tells us they put their life on the line for the sake of the gospel. And we only have this clue. Next slide. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. Here Priscilla's first. My fellow workers in Christ Jesus, they risked their lives for me. Not only I, but for the Christians of the Gentiles who are grateful to them. I wish I knew what it was, but I don't. But somehow, Priscilla and Aquila, together as a couple, did something that put their lives on the line for Paul and for the, all the, the Gentile Christians, for the church, and they're very grateful to them for it. Now, I want to do a little version comparison because I really like uh, some of these other translations um, better. The Holman says, who risked their own necks. Really, that's the idea you find in the Greek. They risked their necks as if you, you think about uh, the chopping block and them having their neck on the chopping block. They risked having their heads cut off for the sake of, of the gospel. The ESV also says risked their necks risked their lives, faced death. Um, they've laid down their own necks, put their lives on the line, risked their own necks. I, like the, I use sometimes this Young's Little translation, the, the YLT, because it's a little more literal. Who for my life their own neck did lay down. That's just about as straight as you can get for what this passage is. They put their necks on the line, on the block. What was it? We don't know, but it is a testament to their faith. The ultimate test. That what they did risked their own lives, their own execution, if you will, for the sake of the ministry. Turn your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. 
I have it mislabeled here on the slide. I'm glad I caught it before the lesson started. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. This is Paul's list of his own peril, of his own putting his life on the line for the sake of the gospel. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I'm more, I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times. I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move, in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger, thirst, gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my own concern for the churches. Paul put his life on the line and his comfort on the line many times for the sake of the gospel. Hmm. It makes me think maybe even shamefully, at um, how unwilling I am perhaps to give up the comforts of life for the gospel. Here's Aquila and Priscilla, and they're willing to put their lives on the line, just as Paul did, we see in this Second Corinthians passage, for the gospel. I also notice in this verse that Paul refers to both Priscilla and Aquila as fellow workers. This illustrates the value that Paul placed upon their second man work. Consider that when Paul was there, that Corinth was the capital of the richest and most important province of the time with 500,000 people living there. Priscilla and Aquila worked in the Corinth outreach, the church outreach, spending a year and a half there, about 50 to 52 A.D., And later, Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila set out and sailed together from Corinth on the second missionary journey. They go to Ephesus in 52 AD, and Priscilla and Aquila planted temporary roots in Ephesus, strengthening, supporting, hosting the church in their home. So when they came into the place, they were there to work, to be Paul's encouragers, fellow workers, in promoting the interests of the church. Ephesus was one of the strongest and most faithful churches at the time. You read the book of Ephesians, you can see that very clearly. Ephesus was also a large city, the capital of the Roman province of Asia. It was very large in population. Only Rome was more important. It became the third most important city in the history of early Christianity. It's in these, these hub cities that Paul does his work and Aquila and Priscilla help. Finally, Priscilla and Aquila are found once more in Rome, again hosting the church in their home. Number four, she and Aquila taught Apollos the way of God more adequately. They did this together as a couple. While in Ephesus, Priscilla and Aquila met a Jew, Jew from Alexandria. Think about where Alexandria is, Egypt. Think about what Alexandria would have been like in the first century. It's prominence, it's library, it's hub of trade and commerce and intellectual um, advancement. Let's read about this event in Acts chapter 18. Verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man, thorough in knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of John. 
John the Baptist. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, now notice what they do, how they handle this with such tact and gentleness. They invited him into their home, no surprise, Priscilla's good at that, and explained to him the way of God more adequately. What a beautiful spirit. And when Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And on arriving, he was of great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now, this loving correction models for us this kind and warm-hearted way to gently teach another Christian worker. It's beautiful. Look at this as a, a pattern, if you will. They invited him into their home. That's a beautiful way to begin. Okay, we've got this guy, he's preaching. He's a great preacher. He's persuasive. He has a lot of talent, but he's preaching only the baptism of John the Baptist. He doesn't know the baptism into the name of Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. He doesn't know that. He just knows John's. What are we going to do about this, Aquila? What are we going to do? Tell you what let's do. Let's not go up to him and let's not blast him in public. Let's not call him down. Let's not embarrass him. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have him into our home, we're going to explain it to him, and we're going to allow him to know more adequately about Jesus. It's beautiful. A warm-hearted correction is gentle and kind, personal, non-shaming. It doesn't take away the truth, it's the, the mannerism is beautiful. And the effectiveness of Aquila and Priscilla's teaching is seen in the results. Paulus doesn't pack up and go back to Alexandria. He doesn't get offended. He isn't upset about it. Because of the manner that it's done, and Apollos' obviously correctable heart, his beautiful correctable heart, he's not discouraged at all. Instead, he's right back out, and now he's got all the information. He's more adequate, and he's ready to go. Blessings all around. Blessing here, blessing here, blessing there. Because it's handled well, received well. You've got to love Aquila and Priscilla for this. Because think of what Apollos was able to accomplish because of their tact and their willingness in a kind and open-hearted way to do this. So the effectiveness of Aquila and Priscilla's teaching is in the results. Not at all discouraged, Paulus went forward to boldly preach Christ, Christ, which we read in verse 28, for he, Apollos, vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. It's kind of like what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 18, isn't it? Go to the person, yourself, and teach them, talk to them about it. So today we've considered this valuable second woman, Priscilla, she shows us what can be done even within the confines of the first century as a woman to further the cause of Christ, using her home, teaching, risking her life, and serving as a fellow worker. Priscilla spotlights what can be accomplished, just like the others we've studied. Behind the scenes, just out of view, in encouraging and supporting the works of God. Listen, all of God's people are valuable. Men and women doing the works of God behind the scenes, serving one another, encouraging. Every now and then, I'm impressed by you because I'll find out somehow some good work that you've done that no one else knew about. And I thank God for a church full of people who understand the value of second men work. Not for people to applaud for you, 
not for you to get your name put in the bulletin, but because you, for God's eyes, and because of your love of Christ and His church, want to serve other people. It's beautiful. And I want to encourage you to excel in your second man gifts because we need that so much in the Lord's church. If you'd like to respond this morning to the Lord's invitation, it'll be for you now as we stand and sing.